Do you know how powerful you are? Welcome to the Risepreneurs Podcast. Welcome to Risepreneurs. Reshaping and elevating your mindset to help you achieve what you believe. Sometimes we don't even see our own greatness. You can't be what you can't see. And connecting black cultures to build a community of talent and success. Black people need to realize that they are assets. You are an asset. When we rise, you rise. Start together as a group. This is Risepreneurs with Terrell Simmons. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you're at, listening in, tuning into the world. Uh, welcome to another edition of Rise of Norris. It's Terrell Simmons. This next guest that I'm about to introduce you to, it's 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 amazing just to see somebody who worked on the Obama campaign, who's been touched by other inspirational women in her life. And I can't wait for you to hear this young lady's story, Monique Dorsonville, who who works at public policy at Facebook and leads engagement to third party think tanks, advocacy organizations and civil human rights organizations to to pretty much talk about Facebook support of small businesses and and particularly minority owned businesses. Shout out to Facebook and everything uh, she's doing over there for the month of August to really support Black Business Month and how empower those businesses but not only that she's empowering black women in both business and tech she's assisted with everything from the company with combating vaccine hesitancy in the communities of color Um, prior to joining facebook monique served in the obama administration as a deputy chief of staff and senior advisor to valerie jarrett and the director of planning and events for the office of public engagement and office intergovernmental affairs a lot of you may not know that my sister was also an appointee in the obama administration so i'm gonna have to reach i'm gonna have to see if my her and my sister even connected at some point in time i forgot to ask her that in the interview but she she did a lot of things with that administration from an internal driver to, to strategic planning to large scale engagements for the former president Barack Obama and former first lady Obama around signature issues signature based initiatives including criminal justice reform health care access women leadership lgbtq rights and a stem education so 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 much depth and knowledge in this young lady's life and it's, it was just a pleasure just to have conversation and share space with her so without further ado the introductory part of getting to know people yeah they, they just give you something really good yeah and it comes it's out true. and i'm like darn we need that for the episode <laughs> <laughs> you're like that's the real content <laughs> that's the real content right um and I, i've had that you know i'm I'm, a, I'm only a year into the podcast world but i've had that happen several times and like i'll, I'll do the setup first and i'm like all right here's the setup here's the premise da, da, da. and then then we'll be talking and then i was like dang could you say that again oh man i don't know how i said that before. like oh man you're like, I was gone. golden right there, it's just gone. like a perfect phrase. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Where are you based right now? I'm based in San Diego, California. Amazing. So where are you at? Are you in LA? Um, I'm in LA. Or? Yeah. So did you? How did the? Let me. Let me. How's the LA girl go to DC with with Barack boogie down Obama? How did that happen? <laughs> let, me, let me start there. <laughs> with so many twists and turns along the way. Um, So I I was born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, I moved away for the first time for school to New Uh Mexico for for two years. Um, Uh From there, I I had a year where I was doing volunteer initiatives um, around the world, really. Um, India, Kenya, Eastern Europe. Um, Then I landed in college in Atlanta. And from Atlanta, um, that's really where I started my political journey working okay. for Stacey Abrams. And uh-huh. she really was the catalyst for me kind of launching into Washington, D.C. When I moved there, I knew no one. I applied for a White House internship. And that was the start of my career working for Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. Man, listen, that is this, like that's like the perfect start to a career. <laughs> 
I don't know how to explain it other than that. Uh, but you have to tell me your process of, you know, the pre getting into that. Because what I like to usually do is because um, uh, I'm originally from D.C., by the way, born and raised in D.C., but I live here in San Diego, Amazing. California now. We swap um, places. I, you know, I'm from California and I live in D.C. I've been there for over 12 years. Yeah. So like we swap places like I started there, ended up here. And I'm like, oh, man, this is beautiful. I, I got to hear that story Cali. at some point. <laughs> you got to <laughs> tell me that one. <laughs> yeah, so I, I came out here. I was like, I'm, I'm never going back. Like, like, why would why would anybody want to leave? Why would California? you do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I know, in retrospect, I, I don't know why I did. I'm glad I did. Yeah. Right? right given how things have played out but at the time you always just want to get away from home when you're young i think that's right. a natural instinct right it just is. to explore something else it is it is like i i also noticed too um when i was living in dc and i would sneak into like howard parties and over there at howard university yeah. it seemed like a lot of people from california would migrate uh to howard <laughs> and then get to know dc or their first stop into the east coast uh and i'm like what's all these cali folks doing here <laughs> it's <laughs> an amazing school trees. i, I, I yeah. can see why <laughs> yeah because it's an amazing school yes uh, all right so let's start to really dive into the interview and just to tell you a little bit about why i started this podcast is because uh, as a young man growing up in washington dc and as i started going to my career journey i didn't see a lot of people that look like us in the different career spaces that I'm in now, uh, as far as government. Even when I go back to schools, I, I, I worked with the mayor out here to do a lot of different youth programs and workforce development programs. And the often problem I see is like the school teachers will call us back and say, hey, you know, could you come speak to the kids? And I would speak to the kids and, and you know, a lot of our black and brown kids. I was like, oh, what do you do? I was like, oh, I'm, I'm I do equity, diversity, inclusion. Uh, I, I run everything for the whole county of San Diego when it comes to that, looking at our policies, programs, procedures. It's like, there's a black guy that does that, right? <laughs> it was like, I was like, yeah, and you could do it too. It's like, oh, I don't know. Like, there's only, I, I think they could, the, you're already there, so there could only be one person. Like, is there anything else? Like, and I'm like, no, right, there right. could be more than one. And right. actually, there's, I have a, I have a sister that works down the hall from me, you know, th th like don't limit yourself. Right. Right. And right. I don't know if you've gotten that throughout your career when, I don't know, do you speak to young people uh, and actually even adults have the same like limiting beliefs. So uh, like, have you ever gotten that in your career? Like, I, as you started to move up? I yeah. really have, um, you know, one of my former bosses and mentors, Valerie Jarrett, she used to always say that this thing that I really relate to. She always said, you can't be what you can't see. And, and I really do believe that even for me growing up in, in Los Angeles, just not, not seeing a lot of folks in politics, right? Not seeing folks of, of color in politics. I didn't know politics was a career that people could go into. I didn't know that was a, a job that, that was possible, right? I, I speak to young people as often as I can. You know, sometimes it's college age students, sometimes it's high school students, one of the most impactful jobs that I had before getting into politics was working with an organization called the Sadie Nash Leadership Project. And the entire mission of the organization is empowering um, young women of color and gender nonconforming youth. And, you know, a lot of the premise is really talking about structural issues in society like racism, sexism, the prison industrial complex, the healthcare complex, right? It's all these systems that affect young people. But if you don't have the language to know that you're experiencing them, you feel so isolated and you feel like it's only you. And I, I think with that knowledge, I think it expands people's possibilities of what they can do and also what communities can do. So I, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's important to really encourage people to get into fields that they don't know are possible, but also to continue to, to bring people along, right? There should be no scenario where one person is the only. You should be opening the door and then like shoving a doorstop into it so as many yeah. people as possible can, can come and join and, and get that experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, like, I like to go back down memory lane and, and go through your journey High school, because I, I know you just alluded to that, you know, I, you didn't see too many people that look like you. you didn't have, you didn't know 
a, a career in government policy. You probably didn't even know what policy was when you was in high school. <laughs> I did not. I did not. So uh, tell me, like, the journey from high school to college, what was that like? How did you transition? And then we'll eventually get to, you know, how do you transition to college to your first career? Yeah. Um, when I was 16 years old, I got a scholarship to a school in New Mexico called the United World College. The mm -hmm. school had 200 students from 90 countries around the world. And the whole premise of the school was basically to experience the world from someone else's point of view. So a lot of experiential learning, a lot of learning just in your day-to-day. -day. My roommate was yeah. from Burkina Faso. I didn't know where that country was from before I met her, right? Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, on my floor, I had a woman from Germany, a woman from Bhutan, someone else from Tanzania. And so, you know, in addition to the academics, we were really just learning about different cultures, different points of view, different ways of seeing the world. And I would say that that experience, those two years, really shaped my worldview. And in some, you know, in, in some sense, it was the base for, for a lot of my political views, too. Mm -hmm. I think the world became a much smaller place than it had been previously when I lived in LA and I hadn't really been anywhere or met anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think to your earlier point, I think exposure is really important in, in, in creating possibility. After that experience, um, I went, uh, I, I took a gap year for a year. Um, my family helped me fundraise um, and I was able to do volunteer projects in India and Kenya. Nice. And I think that was the first time that I just understood poverty in a completely different way. I grew up low income in, in Los Angeles in a single parent household, but being in community and, and meeting folks in India and Kenya who were living on a dollar a day and, and who made something out of that, it really kind of reframed my understanding of what resources and inequity look like in the United States and around the world. After that year, I ended up um, landing in Atlanta for college. I went to Emory University. I studied gender studies and global health. And really, I think it was the, the gender studies that, that helped politicize further the way I thought about different systems. So in gender studies, you, you analyze um, you know, gender, race, class, and how those three systems operate throughout society. And so I think I just found myself seeing the world through a different lens. And it, it was actually my senior year studying gender studies that I had to do an internship. And I ended up applying to an organization called the White House Project. And their whole motto is add women, change everything. And it was through that internship that I got paired to work with then state legislator Stacey Abrams, as she was really starting to transform the landscape uh, the political landscape in Georgia. Yeah. And so that really opened my eyes to what political systems can do. Mm -hmm. I think before that, from a, a gender studies frame, I think I was kind of like, it, there's this really great Audre Lorde quote, the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. I know you know yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so prior to that, I had a lot of critiques of, of government and, and politicians. And I thought, can they really affect systemic change? And then I, I watched her meet with her constituents weekly. I watched her vote on legislation from an ethical place. And I watched her change her community, right? Change the daily reality for her constituents. And, and that, that is what gave me hope that if you put the right people in those jobs, change can, can happen. Yes. Um, so th that was the start of my political journey. And, and from there, um, that, that's how I got to Washington, D.C. Yeah, uh, so so many nuggets in, in that whole journey. The first nugget that I, I would say that resonates with me is, you know, the, the education you get from just being in those environments and, and seeing new people and re looking at your mindset of how you view things uh, from a worldview. And then also uh, and there was a, a part when you had mentioned when you talked about um what was it uh when you when you saw what poverty was really like and, and you grew up in poverty so uh yeah. and and that's the same thing for me when i went to the philippines like and 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 saw you know how certain people were living and it was the first time where i got hit with this conflict of 
oh, I, I'm coming from a place of privilege. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Right. And, and it's a hard, it's a hard, like slap in the face. Like, oh, I, I grew up in the hood and poverty and food stamps, but I was privileged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you start to think about nationality too. Right. Yeah. Right. Just what being American abroad, there's a lot of power that comes with that, regardless mm-hmm. of, you know, where you are on the economic um, or, you know, sometimes, you know, race and ethnicity totem pole in the United States there, depending on the country you're in, there can sometimes be a different currency with mm-hmm. having an American nationality. Absolutely. And where I'm currently at in my journey, uh, some things that you talked about uh, is this, the, the time you spent studying like systems and gender and so forth. Actually, I was just at a training earlier this week by the LGBTQ center here in uh, San Diego. And I got an eye opener lesson to how how gender plays a role in how uh, you know we are gender fluidity and you can have both uh you know that male and and female chromosome and how people identify versus how we place them right right Um, right especially for our trans community and just learning about how these systems that they they currently lived in that we currently lived in the u.s that assign these male and gender roles how they are very disruptive to and and sometimes dangerous to their way of life right right um, it's a binary it's it's a false choice yes it's a false choice right and one thing that i'm working on is there's a a, a training that came out of berkeley um called targeted universalism is how do we change the system so that it fits for everybody so it doesn't have to be this either or thing people think like oh if we're going to um work with the black community or the trans community and and give them things then we're taking away from something and it doesn't have to be an either or we can uplift everybody to get the things that they need and you have to address the system so like say for example an elevator uh, when a if we have an elevator right and it's take take you up to the top floor or no stairs like let's say stairs like if that's the only way to get to the top floor then we l- inherently leave people out people who have wheelchairs disabilities so we yeah. have to create another another structure in this building that uh, that uh, or yeah. in that yeah. system that allows people to get up right yeah yeah and it, there can't be just one means and once you f- fits all right yeah once you create that elevator everyone's using it everyone's able to benefit from something yeah. that is more accessible Exactly. We're completely on the same page. Now I want to, you know, fast forward into policy. Like, what made you get into policy? And then, when you're you, when you're looking at policies, how do you take that that same mindset of what we we both agree on is like? How do we get everybody advanced, right? Because that, that's the space where we come from. And what's the what's the what's the process or procedure that you go through to to you know get people in the room to try to agree on a policy and move a policy forward that helps everybody advance? No, I I don't know what the process is. (laughs) Yeah. Well, let me, I mean, I I should probably start by diving a little bit more into my first job in politics um, when I was a legislative aide for Stacey Abrams. Um, So, you know, once once I got the internship to work with her, you know, I I remember the first day that I I got to the Georgia Assembly building, right? Mm -hmm. I I was walking through the building and I I had heard a lot about Stacey. You know, I, I knew that she was... Uh, a Harper Collins published author. She has a pseudonym named Selena Montgomery. She had co-founded a startup. You know, she, she was really to me this modern day Renaissance woman. And so, you know, I, I was nervous. She still is for, for me. Time. She still is for me. Right? She is. <laughs> she is. So I was I was very nervous to meet her. And when I arrived at the Georgia State Capitol for my interview, unbeknownst to me, they were actually voting that day, right? And so mm-hmm. I, I sat and I waited for her in her office and she walked in and she just said, follow me, we're headed to the floor. Right. And so I I walked behind her as quickly as I could. And, you know, I I was able to sit in the back of the room um, and and listen to the briefing. And, you know, my job with her ended up being a mix of researching bills, planning constituent town halls, monitoring and responding to constituency correspondence. And, and, you know, in, in that work, you're really learning the nuts and bolts of, um, you know, why different constituents have different positions on, mm-hmm. on different policies, right? So I, I think the first thing when you're thinking about policy 
is that it's important to listen to people, right? Mm. I think elected officials are there to serve their communities, not the other way around. And so I think politicians who, who do the best and who move forward the most important policies are really reflecting the needs um, of the constituencies that they work with. I, I would say, you know, after working with Stacy, the space that I, I really learned about policy in was the White House. Um, I was sit, I was anchored on Valerie Jarrett's team. First, I started as an intern in Michelle Obama's office. Then I shifted to the West Wing to work with Valerie Jarrett and her team. Um, she had two teams: public engagement and intergovernmental affairs. And we were kind of like the front door to the White House. So my job there was to work with different community members across constituencies. So labor leaders, environmental leaders, um, business leaders, women's rights leaders, African-Americans rights leaders, right? We also worked with local elected officials. So mayors, governors, state legislators. And it was really a convergence of those priorities that I believe helped the president set the policy agenda, right? So I think one of the first bills that President Obama moved forward was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. And he talks about um, his mother and grandmother, and particularly his grandmother. She was, you know, in roles where, you know, while she should have been getting more senior, she was just leveled out. And then she found herself training young men who had decades less experience than her to be her boss, right? And so the Fair Pay Act really combats that gender stereotyping and the economic freeze that it places on women in the workplace. So I I think symbolically, that was a really important bill. It, It set a really important tone. You talked about the LGBT Center in San Diego. Another really important moment for the Obama administration that I was able to be there for was the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I think, you know, when that policy was passed under the Clinton administration, it it had a very different perception than it did years later when people said, like, no, actually, this silences the LGBT community. This makes it so that people, you know, people are hiding, right? Mm -hmm. And while you may have thought you were doing people a service, don't ask, don't tell, (laughs) um, it's actually not an equitable policy, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I look back to that process... And and it was really led by this really brilliant leader named Brian Bond. He was the president's right hand on LGBT policy. He brought in different stakeholders in the LGBT space, um, so different community organizations, and really talked to them and said, okay, how should we do this? How should we sequence this? What is most important to you in this process? And with that information, he then took that back to the president's senior advisors on the domestic policy side, on the economic policy side. They worked very closely with the DOD because this was a military policy. Getting um, the DOD on board was incredibly important before this moved to Congress. And so there was really, you know, first a stakeholder engagement process. Then there was um, an interagency process within the government Mm -hmm. before that moved to Congress and moved forward. So I I would say when you're thinking about policy, I think collaboration is key. I think listening to communities is key and then making sure that those policies reflect community needs. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I haven't dealt with policy on the same scale that you have, but uh, I I recently got to work on the policy uh, in my my day job at the county where we, we put together a pronoun policy that was brought forth to us by listening to uh, our, our LGBTQ plus community and saying, hey, you know, we want to be able to list this on our signatures, on our business cards. We want to yeah. open up meetings uh, by asking, what is your, your preferred pronouns so that we understand how to provide services and communicate with folks. Uh, and so we, we, we crafted a, a really good policy that is used countywide in government and which started a whole another string of conversations because uh, it's changing the way we do business. So people are like, what is this? I, uh, like, what is this pronoun thing? Right. And then and we, we drafted something that they can easily learn about it with where somebody doesn't feel like they have to be the educator all the time to those folks who don't know. That's amazing. I think something you said is really important. The fact that the policy was countywide and then other people were interested in how to implement that. I saw the same when I was in government. 
you know, one state would figure out how to pass and raise um, the, the state minimum wage. And then part of what we did at the White House was figure out, okay, they have a blueprint for this. <laughs> what worked in that state and how can we then share those best practices with other mayors, other governors, so that people can make the same changes and don't have to start at the beginning? I think to your point, when you're creating good policy, I think it's important to also give people the tools so that those policies can spread further. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. So at a very young age, lived a very rich life, met some very powerful people, traveled around the world, had some experiences. What one good lesson life has taught you? That's a great question. I would say um, relationships. Mm -hmm. Relationships are everything. Okay. So I, I think the through line throughout my career, whether I was in New Mexico or at Emory or, you know, in DC, I think finding your tribe, finding people who are going to support you and uplift you and who want to be a part of your life and your journey is, is so important. I would say, especially to young people, figure out who you want as your mentors, who you want as your advisors, and then figuring out who are the people who are going to like help sponsor your career help you think about big decisions, career, you know, career pivots, find those people and then spend time cultivating those relationships. I think that you don't realize how much support you actually need the more you progress in your career. And in that vein, I, I would also say starting to create healthy habits early around stress mitigation mm. is really, really important. I think that people should find small things that make them happy and incorporate that into their day to day. Um, just making a, a real intentional effort to balance, you know, you're working your life. Hmm. I think nationally, you know, we're always having these conversations around like work-life balance and, and can you do it all? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I really do think if you're in an industry for a long time, if you're working around the clock, if you're really focusing on your career, you can burn out. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish someone had told me earlier you don't have to do it all. You don't have to do it all yeah. at the same time. You can ask for help. You can ask for support. And by the way, like investing in yourself, investing in your physical health and your mental health mm -hmm. will give you a better foundation to create the life you want to live. Yeah. I think mental health is a big topic right now, especially after uh, everybody going through COVID. If, if you have not taken a pause in your life, after, you know, going through COVID, George Floyd, all the things that we've experienced in the U.S., I, I, I think it's a time to really recess, reset, recalibrate and, and, and figure out what do you need to do to, to, to live the best version of life, whatever that means to you. What are some things that you kind of do to help ground you and stay balanced and protect your mental health? I like to write. Um, I love photography. Um, in DC, I, I live in Northeast right next to the Arboretum. Uh -huh. And so I spent a lot of time in the Arboretum, particularly during COVID. My wife and I got a puppy during the pandemic. Aww. We got a pandemic puppy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <laughs> just being able to take my dog out and just, you know, spend more time outdoors. I have, I have two younger brothers and, and two younger sisters. So just being able to spend time um, with family is also really nourishing for me. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just when, it, when I'm not working, just truly unplugging, yeah. right? I had periods in my life where I had like, you know, two phones and like, you know, one was a Blackberry. So it had like a blinking red light on it all, all the time. And so you're constantly in this mode of <laughs> stress and anxiety, right? right? And, you know, the blinking red light could be an email that's really important, or it could just be a news clip, right? But you don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I think what I've really tried to do is um, when I'm off, I'm off, right? And so, you know, I've, I've seen people kind of block the last hour of their workday to wrap things up and then pick a time. But when you're off, you're off. Yeah. And just, I think, giving yourself that mental space to have distance and reset 
is for me at least has been so important in being able to like bring my best self to my work the following day like when you said blackberry you took me back for a second because i was in the <laughs> I was in a class teaching to a group of young folks that said i said something about blackberry they were like what's a blackberry i was like oh my gosh they no, don't do it they did not they did I not like, i was like oh my am i am i i'm 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 that age now. <laughs> we're, they don't, we're that age. Yeah, we're we're that age. I was like, they don't know what a blackberry is. Okay. <laughs> but, but that makes me nervous. <laughs> I know, right? And for any but any any younger folks in here that don't know what a blackberry is, it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a phone that um was very competitive with Apple and all of them at, at its at its height. A lot of business people use it, so uh, look it up, Google it. <laughs> um, a PSA explainer, BlackBerry yeah, explainer, a BlackBerry <laughs> explainer. So, uh, tell me because uh, you do policy at Facebook now. What, what was the transition like from being in the White House to going over to Facebook? What was that transition like, and and uh, is there any similarities uh, in what you, you did at the White House versus what you do now in, at Facebook? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking about that that period. So this was January. This was the last um, month of the Obama administration before the transition. Mm-hmm. For me, I was at the White House for seven and a half years. And so I had a moment after that period where I thought, you know, who am I? What do I do with myself? What is my identity? You know, what am I good at? So I actually had to go through this um, entire process of, of kind of like rediscovering myself and, you know, reminding myself what I cared most deeply about, what am I, you know, what skills I had. Um, I worked with a, an executive coach, actually, mm-hmm. who helped me kind of go through this process to also think about, okay, you've been in this space for seven and a half years, like what, what comes next? Right. Mm-hmm. And I say that because for me, um, I worked for Stacey Abrams and then I directly, you know, I, I had one job with Sadie Nash and then I transitioned to the white house at a very young age. And mm-hmm. I was there essentially throughout my twenties. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that, that was my point of reference. Mm-hmm. And so I had to figure out, do I want to stay in government? If so, is it at the local level? Do I want to pivot to the nonprofit sector? Do um, I want to work in the private sector? And all of these industries are big, right? Mm -hmm. And so starting to kind of like whittle down and really align passion with skill set with sector Mm -hmm. was a hard process. It is. And so um, I took some time to do that. I didn't jump directly into my next job. I think I took about seven months. And uh, when I did interview at Facebook, one thing that was really excited that that I was really excited about was just the the big questions that the tech industry was asking mm-hmm. around, you know, online content moderation, around, um, you know, how you look at privacy, around content creators. There there were just so many, it felt like a new frontier. Mm -hmm. And it also felt like the tech industry, government, you know, third parties, folks were trying to figure it out together, right? Yeah. There were conversations about regulation. How do you regulate something that's so new, right? What does that regulation look like? Mm -hmm. Should you regulate the entire industry or should there be subsets of the industry that are regulated? And so I knew I had a really valuable skill set to bring from the White House. Mm -hmm. And I also knew that I was going to learn something, right? And so when I joined Facebook, the the team I lead now, I engage third-party advocacy organizations, think tanks, and nonpartisan civil rights organizations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm anchored on the public policy team. And my job is really to bring organizations into tech policy discussions. So in, in many ways, there is absolutely a bridge between the work that I did uh, when I was with Valerie Jarrett and with President Obama and the work that I'm doing at Facebook. Many of the same advocacy organizations care deeply about tech, right? The same ones that were involved in different advocacy efforts um, with the government. Mm -hmm. And so a big personal mission of mine has been, how do we diversify the people who are in these conversations, right? When we're talking about privacy, when we're talking about election security, when we're talking about misinformation, um, you know, who's at the table, Mm -hmm. right? Is it the same people who have always been there? 
Is it, um, you know, are, are these all predominantly white spaces? Mm-hmm. So, you know, my goal and, and the work that my team has done has really been to make sure that every part of um, every part of the, the progressive community and members of the civil rights community are at the table for those discussions Absolutely. across constituencies, because you have a different perspective to offer. And I think, you know, when we're thinking about technology, technology can do so much good, Mm -hmm. right? You can connect people through technology. You can um, empower small businesses through technology. You can empower creators through technology, but you're also on the flip side, you have to think about safety, harm, right? You have to think about how these things play out in society Mm -hmm. and they play out in society differently for different people. And so making sure you have different perspectives in these spaces has been crucial to the work that I lead. Yeah, And that was true at the White House, too. That was true at the White House, too. We were very focused on intersectionality. Yeah. And I I think you do such a great job at it, being that you've had all these experience that, uh, one, being a a woman of color, the intersectionality of being a woman of color, also being in the LGBTQ plus community, right? There's those intersectionalities. And sometimes... They they overlap and sometimes there's different things that you can pick out of each of those that affects uh, those communities and all the different other perspectives that you gain from your travels and so forth that allow you to bridge those gaps. You know, I, I find it interesting that the the tech sector because I, I have my own experience with the tech sector. Google had reached out to me like three years ago uh, when I was doing my community work and uh, they were doing a startup weekend and it's like, hey. Uh, you've been mentioned as a somebody in the community that we should talk to to bridge the gap of these startup weekends. Uh, we have these events, but we only seem to get a bunch of white and Asians and we want to get some more people of color. And I, looked, mm. and I looked at it, I was like, well, it's because you're not targeting and you're not in the community. You have to be in the community to get these people from the community to participate in this event. So I can automatically look at this and know it's not for me, right? Because you have the language is not for me. The Where it's located is not where I, I go. It, right, There's right, not a right. bus line that goes over there. So now right. if I don't have a car or have access. Right. I can't get to this place, right? Right. You have to think about all of those factors when, you know, if to really, you have to be really intentional about who you want there. And I mean, the bus line hits on economics, right? Mm -hmm. Not everyone has access to a car. And so just thinking about how to make things as accessible as possible and sending a message that this is for a diverse group of people, Mm -hmm. I I think, I think also requires having diverse people within your organization exactly who can who can help lead right and their team wasn't very diverse so they couldn't understand those those challenges uh but i mean we got through it and we got some more people of color there and going through that experience and even looking at how they led the sessions and what was what was done it was like you know helping them to understand that hey equity diversity is so including because because if you want to create these products that you say or these services or or businesses think about the different lens everybody sees, you know, whether they're from a tech background, from a government background, or even just where they sit as far as me being a straight, straight man or somebody, a person of color, bringing all those ideas to the, and you can see how they form better products, services, because they're, they're coming from their different experiences, where they sit, where from the lens they see it at. And we can, if we really listen and hear each other, we can come together and, and put those things to create the best product service or, or business that you're trying to create. Um, when you think, have these think tanks, which is kind of what you do in the essence, bringing all those people together. I want to pivot to like, because a lot of things you said uh, I, for my listeners who may be trying to pivot in their career. I, I've I've been in this space for some time, but I'm stagnant and um, I'm, I'm having the identity flux. What would you give them as the biggest advice to making a pivot in a career sort of like you did? What What was the biggest what's the biggest thing you would say you would tell them to do? I would say consume everything. So I would say, um, I I think like self-education and continued education um, is really important. I think if you're going to make a pivot to a different industry or a different sector or even a different job within your industry, I would say first try and like scour the internet, buy books, try and learn everything you can. I think right now we're just in an information ecosystem that's so rich where there's so much 
access to um, just background on different jobs, people in different industries who have shared their stories. So I, I would say just do that baseline work. And, and then I would just start to meet people in that industry and have informational coffees, right? I, I think mm. people enjoy talking about themselves, their work, <laughs> um, you know, so ask someone if you can buy them a coffee and just really take that time to sit down and, and dig into their personal story, understand their trajectory, understand where they had roadblocks, understand where they excelled, right? And then also ask if they have resources. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, um, you know, sometimes when you're pivoting into a different career, you're not always able to make uh, an upward move if you're learning the industry. Mm-hmm. So you may have to make a lateral move first to then kind of progress to, to an upward move. But I, I would say learn yourself and then find people who can help accelerate your learning. And then also trust yourself. Mm-hmm. I think the, the biggest investment a person can make is on themselves. Mm. Um, and I think we don't do it enough, right? Yeah. I, what, you know, when I think back to the earliest point in my career, when I was working for Stacey Abrams, I applied for the White House internship on, on the first, it was the first White House intern class for Barack and Michelle Obama. And I got flat out rejected. Oh. I got that email where they said, thank you so much for applying. Unfortunately, like, they, they said, they said, nope. <laughs> right? And so I, I had this, this moment where I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I, this was something that I was really passionate about. I really wanted this. I, I could really see myself contributing to their administration. They were inspiring. They were brilliant people. Right. Mm-hmm. And I almost gave up, but I didn't. I applied a second time and I just thought, you know what? I already put all of the work into this application. I think maybe they added one new essay. I needed one more recommender. You know, let me, you know, just refresh this application. Let me refresh this. Maybe they they didn't understand what I was saying. Let me try to reword it for them so they understand how great I am. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And so I sent it through a second time, you know, fully expecting to be rejected again. And I got the acceptance letter. Wow. And then I moved to DC, lived on a friend's couch while I interned, (laughs) you know, and that decision to apply again changed the course of my career. Man, I love that. So bet on yourself. (laughs) Resiliency. Um, The thing that I also like that you said, the know yourself, um, because I, I, I do think there's so much value in getting to know yourself. Who are you? That's that's something that I have to ask young people all the time. Who are you? Because if you don't know who you are, how am I supposed to know who you are and what values that you bring to the table? And are your values aligned with my values of what, what, what we want to achieve here? Because if they're not in alignment, you're going to find yourself not having the most rewarding and successful career because it's going to be out of an alignment. And then you're going to go through that motion of I'm just here existing instead of thriving, right? or surviving. Uh, um, so um, I, I love that you gave that advice. Now, you're going to, I I can already see that you're going to inspire so many people to go down your career path, get into this policy work and, and try to look for opportunities to make a difference the way you have in your career. What's some advice you would give someone who would like to start a career in your industry? I would say, um, I would say, so advice for someone who wants to start a career in policy and tech. Policy, I would say getting your foot in the door early with an internship is really important. I think for me, when I applied to work at the White House, I I really do think it was the fact that I had um, experience as a legislative aide with Stacey Abrams and a letter of recommendation from her that could demonstrate that I had the experience to work in policy and in politics in a different context. So I would say while you're in college, even while you're in high school, (laughs) um, you know, if you're interested in policy, figure out who your local representatives are. State representatives are typically under-resourced. Many offices, at least when I, you know, worked there, there was very little staff, very little resources. And so I think if you know what you want to do and you know you want to be in that space, go and learn, go and test it out, you know, offer to do an internship. I would also say one of the disparities that I've seen in the policy space is that a lot of these internships are unpaid, Mm -hmm. right? And so it 
it, to your point or that access earlier, I think it limits the pool of people who can actually take three months or six months unpaid and just work. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for me, um, what I had to do was apply in parallel to organizations that offered stipends mm -hmm. to young people in politics who wanted to get their feet wet. Right. So it, it was a stipend that allowed you to pursue an internship that was unpaid. Um, but it also created the opportunity for professional development. And, and I did this in DC while I was at the white house it was called an organization. It was an organization called the Center for Progressive Leadership (CPL), mm. and they put together a cohort of young, diverse people who worked in the political space. Mm. And what they told us was, you may not have a network yet. <laughs> you may not be related to a senator or a member of Congress, right? But your voice matters in these spaces. And so, one, we want to give you the resources to be able to participate and get your foot in the door. And then two, we're building a cohort of you guys so that you have a community in DC. You have people who you can get advice from. You have people who you could bounce ideas off of. You have a network, mm -hmm. right? Um, Cause some people just walk in the door with that from the time they're born. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and but so not, I think you have to correct. Then that, that goes back to our access. Not everybody has access to that. Like, uh, um, exactly. You know, my dad may have been a blue collar worker and doesn't have access to the network to to come into the door with all those different things that other people. And so that's where we have to look at the the playing field and see how we can level that at some point. We'll we'll we'll, we'll tackle that. This is one of my to do lists in life. <laughs> I, I'll be right there with you. And I think particularly if you're amongst, you know, in, in my case, like one of the first people in my family to go to college. Right. Yeah. You know, if, if you're an immigrant, um, you know, my, my my mom's family, my grandmother's from Haiti, right? There are just these different systemic barriers that you, you know, you, you're constantly kind of pushing up against and, and trying to break through. Just to, to finish your question on the tech side, I, I would say interning at a think tank that focuses on tech policy, mm -hmm. interning at an ad advocacy organization yeah. or civil rights organization, um, Many have um, tech policy fellowships. Oh, really? That's a really, yeah, that's a really, really great way to get your foot in the door. And then, I mean, you, you mentioned um, the, the program at Google. A lot of tech companies have um, programs where they're helping train young people who are interested in product engineering, coding. Um, there's internships in the policy departments. A lot of these opportunities are generally not widely advertised, but they're there. So mm -hmm. I would seek out those opportunities. Once you get into the ecosystem, then you meet people, you build relationships. And from there, that, that becomes your network. Mm -hmm. that, that becomes like the legs of your stool. And that helps you kind of leapfrog from one opportunity to the next. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what became my network when I first came in. And I started meeting all these amazing people of color in different arenas and tech and entrepreneurship. And I was like, man, I didn't, I didn't even know that these different things, jobs existed. And then there's so many people of color just doing amazing things. There's, I was like, their story needs to be told. So that they, other people can see this and they can aspire to go into these career pathways. So I love it. I, I love it. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that we got a chance to meet today too. So what do you think the future has in store for, you know, the tech and policy industry, especially when it comes to getting more people, um, diverse groups of people into these spaces? I would say one interesting concept that I am still trying to wrap my head around <laughs> is, is the metaverse. I, I, you know, we think that over the next five to seven years, um, in the next chapter at, at Facebook, we will effectively transition from people seeing us primarily as a social media company to being a metaverse company. And I, I think for those like me who okay, you gotta break are, are down. still learning what? about the space, I'm going to break it down. Okay, The, the metaverse, <laughs> it's, it's a, a vision that spans the entire tech industry. And the way I think about it is... Um, basically like a successor to the mobile internet. Uh -huh. So the metaverse will essentially be an embodied internet where instead of just viewing content, you're in the content and you wow. feel present with other people as though you're in the same place, having the same experiences. Wow. Um, so you can think about things like movement therapy, um, fitness, like 
you know, you know, thinking about how teams collaborate, communicate, you, you know, getting together and, you know, whiteboarding together, like you're physically there, you feel like you're physically there with people. I think that's the next horizon. That's, that's certainly what, you know, what we're, we're focused on at Facebook. And I think in general, to your point around access and communities, I think anytime new technologies are adopted in society, I think it's essential for, you know, the communities who that technology will affect to have a seat at the table and one, experiencing the technology, but two, being involved in the policy discussions around the technology, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about issues of privacy, um, when we're talking about issues of data portability, um, you you know, I I think it's important for diverse communities Mm -hmm. to have a seat at those tables. And so that, that is what I am focused on at Facebook, making sure that um, the community leaders and the organizations that I work with are a part of those discussions. Like my mind is blown from this metaverse thing. Like you thought the world was falling <laughs> down. That, that's, that's taking it to another thing. I got a zillion and one questions about the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. So do I. <laughs> it's like, when is it going to get here? How, how do people in lower income neighborhoods access the metaverse? How will they be <laughs> included in the experience and discussion? But no, we would... I think I think those are the questions that we have to continue to push the tech industry to answer. I think those are also the questions that we have to push uh, to your policy question you know, folks who are making policy and, 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 you know, thinking about tech regulation, those are the questions that we have to push them to ask as well. Yeah, Cause I was like, I definitely want everybody to experience metaverse. I don't, I don't want there to be a red line like around metaverse, like we deal with housing and, and access to everything, you know, so they, a lot of Yeah. You don't want to create the same systemic inequalities in the metaverse that exist in real life. Yeah. So I want the metaverse to be Whatever I could, what, whatever you strive to be, you could be it in the metaverse, and you can create change and and uh, break down barriers. And yeah, a lot of questions. So we'll, I'm sure we'll continue to talk about the metaverse for a long period of time. You've opened my eyes to a whole new thing now. <laughs> I think we will. <laughs> uh, all right. So, what projects are you currently working on, and, and where can people find you? Yeah, I mean, um, it, you know, in, in my day to day, I'm working with nonprofit leaders, advocacy leaders. Um, and nonpartisan civil rights leaders on tech policy issues. But one area of work that my team is focused on right now, since we're in August, is um, Black Business Month. And I'm really proud um, of the work that Facebook as a platform has done to support Black business owners, particularly during the pandemic. You know, when we thought, thought about a tailored response to the pandemic, you know, as soon as the pandemic hit, we knew that small businesses were going to need capital. We knew that folks were going to need digital skills training, and we also wanted to find a way to proactively elevate and 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 create visibility for Black-owned businesses. Mm. So, I mean, you know, Black-owned small businesses, Black creators, and nonprofits that serve the Black community. We had uh, a number of monetary investments in that space. We also set uh, a goal of um, at least one billion as it relates to diversity supplying. So making sure that diverse suppliers are really in that financial ecosystem Mm -hmm. um, this year and every year moving forward. Another thing that we focused on was large scale events and trainings. So really helping millions of people get the digital skills and information that they needed really in in, in the most critical kind of sales periods online. Mm -hmm. I think you and I talked a little bit about access earlier. So you know, one of the things we're doing is giving 100,000 scholarships to Black students, nice. um, specifically to work on digital skills certification. Um, and that, that's a program called the Facebook Blueprint Program for anyone who wants to learn more. And, you know, the last thing I'll lift up is, you know, Black entrepreneurs, small businesses, local shops can now identify their page as a Black or minority owned business nice. on Facebook. So anyone who wants to specifically support you know, black entrepreneurs, black businesses, you know, they can find them and they can do so. So that is what's exciting me (laughs) right now. I think it's really important to make sure that black businesses and minority owned small and medium sized businesses are supported. I love it. I love it. Um, And and, uh, give that scholarship name once again. 
Yeah, the scholarship is called the Facebook Blueprint Program. Facebook Blueprint Program. And then I'll try to get that from her and email and put it in the show notes for everybody. Where can people find more information about, because I definitely want to link up with you for the Black-owned businesses and if there's training around that, how people can access it. Where can they find more information about that? Yeah, um, you can go to um, Facebook's website. um, And if you click Facebook Blueprint Program, you can find information there. There's also uh, information on Black-owned businesses. We have a blog called Support Black-Owned Businesses with our Buy Black Friday gift guide that was published on October 30th, um, and that is in our Facebook newsroom. But I will send all of this to you via email okay. so that folks can can easily access it. Awesome. And then I'll add what she sends me an email to the show notes. And don't worry, I'm not going to I'm not going to let her too far on my site. I'm, I'm going to make sure I connect with her after and, and make sure we stay in touch. <laughs> I would love to stay in touch as well. And you asked how people can find me on Facebook. I'm Monique Dorsonville on Instagram. I'm at M Dorsonville and on Twitter. I'm at. M O Dorsonville and Dorsonville is D O R S A I N V I L. I love it. Love it. Monique, we could probably talk all day, but I want to make sure, I don't know if people are driving, but I, I usually say drive time, but uh, whatever their time in between the space of work and to the coffee machine and back, I try to not, not take too much of their morning work day or whatever they tune in. Uh, so let's end it off uh, like this. Uh, what's one last thing you would like to leave for those people who are listening to this and, and hearing your story? Any words of wisdom? My words of wisdom um, are around really honing in on the contribution you can make to the world. I think in I think in the spaces that we're in now, <laughs> I think there's a lot of messages coming at us around who we should be, what we should do. And I think I think the more that I listen to, you know, what are the unique contributions I can make? Who can I learn from? And, you know, what do I want to see in the world? What do I want to see that's different? And how can I be a part of that change? So I would encourage um, folks who are listening, particularly young folks who are listening, to really um, invest in uh, their ideas, mm-hmm. invest in the people they love around them and, and hold those people close and really focus on what you want to see that's different in the world and figuring out a plan to tackle and change it. Mm, love that. Love that. And Monique said it best. Be the change you want to see in the world uh, and focus on those ideas. And I, I promise you they will come. Monique, thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I, I look forward to doing this again sometime. <laughs> I would love to do this again. Um, it was such a, an honor to be on Risepreneurs. I, I think the community you are creating here is dynamic. Um, it's needed. And I think you're helping people grow and and just have access to so many different perspectives so thank you so much i look forward to staying in touch i appreciate it thank you for listening to another episode of the risepreneurs podcast thank you for taking the journey be sure to like comment and smash that subscribe button and stay connected with terrell on and off the show follow at risepreneurs on all platforms do what you love love what you do don't chase the money let the money chase you